Welcome, everybody. My name is Patrick Heidman. I'm moderating this wonderful Filmmakers Live talk with the director, Hafstein Gunnar Sigurdsson. Did I say that correct? Yes. <laughs> and of course, the wonderful Timothy Spall. And yes. And I'll start with you, Timothy, because I know you're a man who loves the sea. You have a boat. Yeah. How good of a flyer are you? Well, you know, if I don't, I don't relish the prospect of flying. Um, it's more the flying itself is not so bad. It's more of the pain in the ass you have to go through nowadays to get on a plane. I mean, when I was younger, people used to say, oh, what are you wearing on the plane? You know, there was like an event. People used to get excited about flying. Now you feel like you're a criminal. <laughs> Every time you go in an airport, you know, you feel like you've done something wrong or you're about to do something wrong. Um, and I think it's the, it's the rigmarole of the whole process of flying, which it's going to, if you're not paranoid, it's going to make you paranoid as soon as you arrive in an airport. <laughs> yeah, but once you're up there, you're good. Well, what can you do? You can either freak out, get on with it, because otherwise, if you do, you're going to get off and you're not going to get where you're going. <laughs> Hadi, for you, I think it was your brother, right, who was afraid of flying, and then you got inspired to do this film, or how was it? Yeah, uh, he, he doesn't like flying at all. And uh, I, I was a film student in New York. Uh, this was more than 15 years ago, and he wanted to come and visit me, and, and he just was dreading the idea of getting on a plane and couldn't, you know, get himself to do that. So he signed up for one of these courses and that was the first time I heard about that, you know, they had these special courses to, to deal with these issues and I thought it would make a really good uh, premise uh, for a film, uh, for, a, for a comedy uh, uh, to sort of expose, you know, character vulnerabilities uh, in, in a funny way and, 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 and pose big questions, existential questions. Yeah. Did the course work for your brother? Did it help? I don't know if I should be talking about this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he couldn't get himself to get on the final flight. <laughs> but he eventually came a year later okay. and he does fly today. Good. He just doesn't like it. Yeah. Did you do some research about these courses? Because I had never heard of them. Mm, yeah, I did. I, I started looking into it uh, after I heard about it. And I, like I said, it's an idea that sort of stayed with me for a very long time. And I didn't really know what it was for a long time. And uh, the, the first version of the script was about a group of Icelanders um, flying to Germany, actually, and getting stuck there. And um, even then, more dreadful. Yeah, <laughs> you think. Uh, but, um, but then somebody suggested doing it the other way around, and I gave it a thought, and, and I realized that it was actually, it raised the stakes, it made it much more intense, you know, to get stuck up on that island uh, instead. So, yeah. And that was the point where you decided to make this your first English language film? Or? Yeah, because the story kind of lent itself naturally to that transition and, and I had been sort of thinking about making uh, an, uh, an English language film because uh, Iceland is small, there are 375,000 people who live there, we make maybe six, seven films a year and if you want to make a film on a quicker pace than every three, four years, then you kind of need to work in another language. So, yeah. Timothy, what was it for you in the script that made you go, oh yes, I want to meet this Icelandic guy and make a film with him? Well, uh, I read the script and it made me laugh. Um, that, and that, that is quite, you know, it's more rare than you imagine. Uh, <laughs> particularly when somebody's a, it says comedy on it, or, or it's selling itself as comedy. I've read many comedies, uh, and they do struggle to make me laugh. And I feel very tired at the end of them, because I've tried very, very hard to laugh, <laughs> and I haven't. Um, that doesn't mean it doesn't end up being funny. Uh, perhaps I've got no sense of humor, I don't know. But Hattie's script made me laugh a lot, you know. Um, and it's not so much that it's, you know, it's comedy, in inverted commas. It's the, tr it's the truth in it. You know, and when Hadi and I eventually met, I think pretty soon we both agreed that our tastes were very much what we value um, 
more than anything, and I think it's the root of all really good comedy, is that the perfect mixture between the ludicrous and the profound. If you can catch that, I think you really are touching the center of proper, proper comedy, really, rather than it being, um, you know, a comedy uh, designed based on situations that are tropes, you know? Would you say that this is Icelandic humor? Is there such a thing as Icelandic humor? Um, there probably is. I mean, there is a, I think also there's a, a connection between sort of Nordic and British humor. It's kind of uh, uh, dry, cold, sarcastic. Uh, uh, but like Tim said, you know, there has to be truth in it. And comedy is a very difficult format. And, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, you need to sort of just trust it and don't force it and let it come naturally and 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 yeah and play it sort of from an honest point. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I had a feeling that um, it might go well here, and it, last night it did. It went very well, didn't it? Um, yeah. uh, because you've got a wonderful word here, and I forgive me if I pronounce it wrong. Is Schadenfreude, <laughs> and this film is a is a celebration <laughs> of that. It's, this is at its very center. Yes. <laughs> uh, and Schadenfreude can be both very funny, but it also can move you, can't it? You can be touched by it. You can be, you know, there's the two great words are, you know, there's um, pathos mm -hmm. and bathos. And I think there's quite a lot of bathos in this as well, you yeah. know, where things of, uh, you know, they try and then all of they descend into hysteric, you know, into ridiculousness. And I think, I, in my experience, I've noticed that when things are tr really true, they're often both, can be both tragic and funny at the same time. For me, I have to say, comedies sometimes suffer from the wrong cast. So yours is perfect. How did you, you know, what were you looking for in your actors, and specifically, of course, in Timothy Spall? Well, I mean, Tim is, of course, an actor that I have admired for a very long time, and he's uh, just always sort of brings this sort of warmth uh, to sometimes flawed characters and that was something we were really looking for and, and his uh, comedy and, 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 and like with Edward it was supposed to be this kind of uh, uh, unpredictable force in the script that you sort of unfolds as, as things go crazier and crazier and, and I, I just thought he was uh, quite uh, perfect for that and, and luckily uh, he liked the script, and we, 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 we liked talking, and we shared the taste on how to do these things, and, and, and it went from there. Well, also, you sent me, um, Hadi sent me three of his films, or somebody did, I think, maybe it must have been with your permission, yeah. and um, I was watching all of the, uh, I was in Germany, actually, um, making a film called Spencer, about the, the Diana. Of yeah. course. And um, I was watching the, all the screeners for the Academy, which I'm privileged to be a member of. And I was going through them, and there's hundreds of them. And uh, I'd watch a couple, and then I'd watch one of Hadi's films, and then I'd watch a couple. And, then watch, and by far, my three favorite films out of all his, <laughs> and none of them were Academy <laughs> screeners. So I thought, I'm going to have to work with this guy, you know. And then we Thank met. you, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, you were mentioning the the ludicrous and the profound, mm. which I think is really crucial for this film, because actually all these characters have quite tragic stories. Mm -hmm. um, and we spoke earlier, you told me you even did some research and spoke to people who went uh, to the Falkland Wars and yeah. have P PTSD or, I don't know, yeah, trauma I, I or something. Looked, yeah, I looked a lot. There's, a, there's quite a lot of footage. There's one particular guy um, who I found who talked a lot about the... Um, he was, I think it must have been on YouTube. I never know. I just press buttons and people go, you know, I don't know what it is. Um, uh, as you can see, I'm not a TikTok sensation, so I don't, uh, I don't. Um, uh, and there's a guy who talks very graphically um, about his whole experience, about going in that window. He was one of the guys that came through and he was actually kind of a slightly comical character very ordinary. He looked like some guy you'd see working in a baker's or a butcher's or, or in an office or, you know, he just didn't look like a, he just looked like an ordinary guy. And I think maybe that's another reason that I had to go, because, you know, I don't look, don't even look like an actor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, 
and he talked a lot. And there's a sequence in it. It's a kind of mime show where you see him in his room going through it, kicking, and it's all based on exactly what he said, this character about what he went through. But also there's a whole, you know, it's only in the last, isn't it, uh, 20 years that the whole P, you know, uh, PTSD thing has come. You know, people went through wars, terrible. Everybody has therapy now, even if they, you know, get a, a stale loaf of bread. They, they have to, you know, they have to go see a, a specialist to get over it, you know. <laughs> and, you know, people fought whole wars and never, never nobody ever said to them, you know, um, you need counselling, you know. And uh, so, so Edward was a character who's really got, and sometimes PTSD takes a long time to come out. And I think that was an interesting thing in this. And, uh, you know, there's lots of people. There's still people. There's men in their 90s now who still won't talk about things they've, did, they've done. You know, they just can't do it, you know. And uh, I think it comes out. And that's what I think uh, had his script catches so brilliantly. The, this extremist, this terrible uh, yearning, desire to get away, to get to safety. And the only way to get safety is to go through danger everybody goes back into their default actions, you know, and I think, you know, Edward just tries to, you know, he just becomes operational, you know. And then, of course, there are other characters where you obviously make quite a bit of fun of. I mean, influencers, tech guys, parents even. What were the targets, so to speak, that you were looking for? I mean, for? It's, it is kind of ridiculous, like, you know, like Tim said, like you know, people having therapy or like taking courses to, you know, become a better version of themselves to go on a vacation. You know, it's quite ridiculous that you pay a lot of money to go on this fear of flying course so you can go on a course so you don't feel terrible on the way. And like, uh, I mean, it's kind of a first world problem in a way. And, uh, and um, yeah, so I think we want to sort of tap into that a little bit as well. Another big character even in the film is Iceland of course maybe not as front and center as in some of your previous mm -hmm. works but it is very essential did you yeah what what why was it important to have Iceland uh, in the film it's kind of a metaphorical hell in a way you know um, and and like for Edward you know Iceland and actually Falkland the landscapes are very similar uh, in some parts so like for his character he would get triggered by that landscape, you know, but uh, but we we were also just trying to use the the landscape to sort of externalize the 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 internal of the characters to use that as you know to 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 visualize the the inner life of the, of the characters and and create this hell that they were going through. Yeah. Were you familiar with Iceland before? Had, had you been there? No, I, I'd never been to Iceland. I, I'd always wanted to go, and uh, and we went straight to um, Miva, uh, which is the very north where most of it was shot. Mm -hmm. And I liked it immediately, but it is remarkable. There is something both very, very beautiful, uh, really beautiful about it. Um, you, you wouldn't have thought that just so much snow could be so beautiful, you know, and, but it's in the, the way it sits in the landscape and this um, volcanic world. It, it's there's something, um, it's a white desert, really, and um, and it feels very, you know, as soon, there's not many people there either, very few people. So when you drive away, you feel kind of isolated, you know. It, you turn up and then all of a sudden there'll be a little supermarket or a shop selling pizza. You think, actually, I thought I was in the tundra here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it does have a very um, um, remote feel about it. It, it really is a, a kind of a... There's a wonderful, there's a power in it as well. I don't know whether it's to do with the fact that there's so much thermal activity under it. I mean, the fact that when you run your water, it comes directly out of the earth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all your heating system, everything, it's just sort of boiling on volcanic. There's mm -hmm. something in it. Um, that, and the, you know, the people are very friendly. Yeah, and uh, that's also part, I mean, this film is so much about control and lack of control. And that's also being faced with nature, which is just completely, you know, uncontrollable. And, and that was a sort of another part of it and, and using it also as a, as a contrast to, to London. Yeah. Can you imagine shooting a film that's entirely not set in Iceland? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm slowly 
getting there. I'm putting one foot out now and, yeah. and maybe I'll put two feet next. Yeah. You did study in the US, as you mentioned before. Uh, what would you say, in, in what way did that inform your filmmaking style? Uh, I don't know. Um, um, I mean, I basically, I, I, I like to make films because I'm interested in people and I'm curious about people in general, about characters, and um, I think there are a lot of uh, fantastic American filmmakers that have influenced me, like, you know, Robert Altman, for an instance. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to take from there, but also being from Iceland, which is kind of situated between America and, and Europe, I think we sort of take, you know, influences from, from, from both, both places, and, and yeah. Timothy, maybe it's too much of a generalization, but would you say that filmmakers who are not from the English language world have a different sensibility in their work? Well, it depends on what the subject matter is. You know, obviously, if it's very particular about a very particular cultural aspect of a society, well, the sensibilities will be different because we'll be concentrating on it. But I think, you know... Uh, you know, human behavior is universal, it's, it's fundamental. Uh, people share the same, you know, feelings, the same desire, and, you know, the same desires. They want to get through the day without being hurt, or, and hopefully not hurting anybody, bringing up their children, making sure they're happy, enjoying their food, making sure they go to the toilet properly without it being agony, you know, all the simple basic <laughs> functions. And they're aspirational, they want to get better. So I think, really, I mean, and you notice, I notice, and I don't watch a lot of world cinema, but I notice that you can watch a, you know, an Iranian film or an African film, a North or South African film or a, a Chinese film or a Korean film. And what strikes me about it is, although there are cultural differences and, um, you know, uh, behavioral uh, things, fundamental truths will transcend and will show you and the honesty of filmmaking filmmaking is only storytelling and any honest storytelling if it somehow reflects however outlandish the human condition which is you know you know you know it's 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 across the across the universal i think it, it's that's all there is to say the medium of the illiterate sorry the medium of the illiterate <laughs> <laughs> said a german film director um you were saying earlier how the script was the first thing that convinced you because it was funny. Um, is that always the case when you decide on taking on the role, the script, or are there other factors that come into play? Well, sometimes there isn't a script. You know, um, I've done a lot of films with Mike Lee, and he, the script is, it comes out of the, I won't go into the details of that, it'll take forever. Um, <laughs> but, um, so there are exceptions. But yes, I think the script is always of paramount importance. You've probably heard it before, but there's a wonderful old um, saying, and forgive me if it's either offensive or, or just boring, because you've heard it a million times, you can't polish a turd, you know. <laughs> you cannot shine up a piece of shit. Um, you can roll it in glitter and make it shine and sparkly, but inside it's still a piece of shit. So, you, you know, that's the reality. If it's not the script isn't good and the story isn't fundamentally, things can be improved, things can be developed, but fundamentally it isn't right, you're not going to make it right unless you've got days and months and months and there's a structure to create a story. I think it's very difficult without a very, very good ground point script. Yeah, and then it's also not that important how big the part is or... Well, no, I mean, it's always good to get a big part, you know, and... It, 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 <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I spent a lot of time playing smaller parts and it came later that I started to play bigger parts. So, and also when you play larger parts, you get more chance to develop characters more. You get more chance to be able to show color and shade in characters. You can, it's in a storytelling way, you can, you know, you can develop something and, and investigate. Where if you come in, you have to whack it in and you've got to, but fundamentally, you know, you are the servant of the story. And I think I, if I always tell young actors that, what's your advice? I always say, make sure that you're, you're only important because you're playing the character. 
The character is far more important than you. You make sure absolutely con you concentrate on what the character does, and then the character will take care of you. Never try and make the character make you look good. Always make you make the character look good, and then the character will look after you. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that goes for filmmaking in yeah. general. You know, it's we are there to serve a story, and yeah. all your decisions are based on you know the story that you're trying to tell. You you can't force like all the things on it you have to listen to w what it is uh, at the core of it and and that makes it truthful yeah and the desire to tell it and you always have to remember because there's so much flim flam around filmmaking and the cult of the personality and glamour and all that shit that doesn't exist you know that you know it is for people like yourselves who go to the cinema work hard and pay or pay for netflix you're paying for something. You're actually paying us to tell your stories. I mean, and it's always good to remember that there is an audience that we who deserve the best possible product. Mm -hmm. You know, that is in a kind of slightly, you know, you know, mechanical sense or, or a, you know, an emotional thing. That is what you're trying to do. Is you know, is that people are. You know, they want to be entertained, or they, and sometimes you can be entertained and, and you can be informative, and sometimes you can move people if you're lucky as well. So it's a privilege, you know. This might be a good point to ask both of you how you even became interested in telling stories, in making films. How, how did you end up here, basically? I know you come from a humble working class family, for example. How did you, or when did you first dream of becoming an actor? Um, I don't know. I just sort of became one, really. I, <laughs> um, I, I, I remember why. Uh, I try and keep this short. I, I used to. I lived on a council estate, um, and it was quite a rough area at night. And I used to. My grandmother came, and she had another flat quite close. And I used to. My parents used to ask me to walk her back at night, so there was some, you know, dodgy people about. So she was. And one day I dropped her off and I saw this old man walking, coming out of a lift. And I must have been about 15. And I had absolutely no reason to do it. I saw him, the way he walked and the way he was just walking along. And I just started to become him. I just <laughs> started to walk like He couldn't see me and I certainly wasn't taking the mick. I just wanted to feel what he felt like. And... I just became him for about 10 minutes and just stayed like him. <laughs> and it wasn't like, oh, oh, I, 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 can I turn this into a million dollars? I can see an Oscar. I just wanted to be somebody else for a while. And I think that's always stuck with me. I, I find that very, very interesting. I still do it now. I will see somebody do something and I'll start becoming them a bit. You know, it's just, I think it's just one of those it's a vocation more than a choice, really, or an affliction, really. I mean, you know. <laughs> How about you? When did you fall in love with films um, uh, or filmmaking? Yeah, filmmaking. I'm, I mean, I used to um, skateboard obsessively as a teenager, and I started making these sort of homemade uh, skateboard videos with my friends, like bringing two VCRs and connecting them and doing a very primitive, you know, editing. And then as I grew older, I, I, I got more and more interest in, in sort of the medium, the, the, the craft of the, the, the filmmaking, and, and, and that sort of took over. And um, there wasn't really a good film school in Iceland at the time, uh, so I studied uh, literature because they had a little bit of film studies. And then eventually I, I, I decided to go to a film school in New York. If any of you have questions, just raise your hand. Um, is there a microphone? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you very much, it's great to talk to you. Uh, I've not seen the film yet, but looking to it. Um, just wondering, um, with Mr. Spall playing the uh, older character, Edward, do you have the feeling that um, this, um, that, that between generations that people sometimes they don't understand each other very well. For instance, that the, maybe the younger characters mm -hmm. don't know what the Falklands War was or they heard that it was something what, that Margaret uh, Thatcher used a lot to get reelected so they don't take things seriously. And uh, so that maybe there's a bit of a generation problem. Like I said, the younger 
don't really understand the older ones, although they have to stick together to overcome this fear. Is this so, or sort of an idea in the film also? Um, yes, there is a, a, a long distance between uh, many of these characters, and they, you know, are have not chosen to get stuck together and sort of having to work together and overcoming their fears. And yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that's a part of it. That's what I was intrigued by having a group of strangers uh, that need to sort of sort out quite big issues. Yeah. Ow. Mr. Paul. No, I was just saying, no, I did, when we were sitting in the, in between takes, sitting in the Land Rover a couple of times waiting to go back up and shoot another drive-by, I, I did spend a, about 15 minutes explaining um, a little bit about the Falklands War, because people, are, because, you know, actors, uh, contrary to popular belief, tend to be quite intrigued by other things other than acting, <laughs> so they had, va they had vaguely heard of it, but it was... Uh, especially to Ella, um, who was a young, I, you know, and uh, Swiss, so I, you know, I explained a bit, and they had no idea really what yeah, it yeah. was, you know. I mean, but that happens now. I mean, I, I, you know, my my son's a, an actor, and he, he's forty, and I sometimes speak to some of his friends about a actors from sort of other things, and you just get that because they don't. I mean, it's just it's just what it is, you know. I mean, it, you, peop, there is a gap, but that doesn't mean we don't share the same humanity. We just don't share the same experiences, do we? So, thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, if not, I'll just keep on going. Um, because I have a silly, very silly question, and, and I have often wondered that in films that are shot in the plane. Uh, how do you do that? Do you rent a plane? Do you build a set? Yeah. Uh, what? How did you go about yeah, it? It's a, it's a very good question, and, and that's what's interesting to filmmaking. There's always like a very unique problem to every film that you need to solve and work out. So, um, yeah, we had to figure out how to build a set um, and, and move it, you know, yeah. so you can actually shake it because there are ways of doing it you can build a set and then you can just have the actors like you know shaking and and shaking the camera and it's probably not gonna no. be very convincing but sometimes you can people, always tell yeah people do that so um and one of the reasons i guess that we did this film eventually in english is that it had you know it just had a, a higher budget than a normal icelandic film would have so doing it in English that would open up possibilities in, in financing. So we ended up uh, renting a ma machine which is called a gimbal, which is this kind of uh, lift that would you would kind of see in amusement parks, you know. Uh, and uh, we brought that from London to Iceland where we shot in a studio. We built the set, um, just the 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 priority or, or, or the, the first class section of the of the uh, plane and we put that on that gimbal and then we were shaking these wonderful people for a week uh, yeah. and, <laughs> and, and that, that poor flight attendant that yeah, crashed the ceiling yeah which is actually my wife um, <laughs> um, it's a longer story she <laughs> injured herself terribly when we were doing that scene um, but she's good now. Okay, uh, I was going to ask. And, and we still live together. <laughs> and um, no, so it, it was a, a technical issue, you know, that had to be solved. And, and I, um, I think since you asked, that meant it worked, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it did. It. <laughs> and to keep raising your hands if you want to ask a question. That'd be, oh, there's one. Hi, sorry for Mr. Spall. <laughs> sorry. Um, over the course of your career, you played many roles, also was dramatic, comedic, like in, in this film. Has your approach to playing these characters at all changed over the, the years, or do you, have a, do you even have an approach to getting into these characters, or do you just become them like you just told us with the fella on the, on the sidewalk there? Um, well, there's always that. It's basically that, becoming someone else, you know? Um, but you've got to, you can do that. Most people can do that if they really try. But you then got to make choices. You know, when you read a script, you make acting as a series of choices as well that you have to fit into the jigsaw of the pattern of that character's journey through the, through the script, through the tale. You know, and you have to, 
you know, um, try and dig. I've just tried to dig more and more deeply as I've got older. And as you get older, you've experienced more. You know, you've had some good things and you've had some bad things. As you get older, you get ill uh, occasionally. And I was very ill a long time ago, and I dip into that now. It's you know, so you can use everything. The great thing about being an actor and getting older is you've got this bigger, ever-growing lagoon of experience, good and bad. And that means you don't have to push it so much. And because often in, with the forensic quality of film acting, it's unbelievable, and you see it in great, really good acting, I think, when someone's feeling something, really something, and they're, they're achieving something in their performance that is a mixture of things, a mixture of emotions, where you're seeing somebody saying something but you know they're also not really believing it or are they and there's something else under that is it funny is it tragic i think as you get older you're going to try and always bring in the extra stitches of the tapestry of experience into it hopefully uh, without it seeming like you're showing it you know and that and the one thing i can assure you of and be truthful about is that i still get very nervous i still I read a script, I get excited about it, and then I get terrified because I think, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I think, if they, do they really mean me? Um, or if I do this, am I, am I going to be the same? So I never, I still have the fears. I still, and at a read-through, I'm sitting with the young actors and they are expecting me to be really, like, confident. But I'm just as nervous as them. It's just, it's a, it's a real bizarre mixture of maintaining a, a vulnerability and a sensitivity to all possibilities, but also the paradox of the growing confidence. So you're both deeply insecure, but confident enough to keep pushing through with that insecurity. <laughs> and I think as you get older, you just mature that technique of the duality of insecure confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you're insecure about in your filmmaking, which you, uh, I know, I don't know, became aware of during the making of this film? Um, no, I think w w what Tim said is very truthful, and I think anxiety is a great driving force. You know, it keeps you on your toes. You know, if you fear things, then you you you're alarmed, and you you make sure that you do your absolutely best. Uh, so I think the fear of failing is is very important in all you know creative process and probably most processes like in in all jobs and 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 so i think um, i think actually i couldn't phrase it any better than than what t tim said but okay. yes you uh, of course then learn like so much from every single film and as a filmmaker you know you grow and you 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 i think you get better with every single film you know uh, yeah, I was going to say experience obviously helps a little bit, right? Would you say, do you enjoy your profession more these days or did you have a different fire in your belly when you were young? No, I'm still, I'm still very, very interested in new challenges. Yeah, just as, yeah. Um, I'm less um, likely to chase, be chasing my tail about, you know, you know, and then you go through periods where you're very much in demand and then you dip out and then you have to accept that. And the other thing about actors and every actor I've ever known, if they finish a job and they don't know what the next job is, they assume that's at the end of their career. <laughs> I mean, I've been acting now for like 45 years nearly and every time I finish a job and I, I don't know what the next job is, that's it. <laughs> Fine, I've been found out and that's it, it's over. And that's a genuine emotion. And that's very good because you can get all people being charming about you, paying you lots of compliments. But the stiffening humility that comes with a bout of unemployment really makes you, <laughs> really <laughs> kicks your arrogance in the balls. <laughs> oh, there's a question in the first row. Thank you both for your wonderful film. And thank you to Timothy for your words about filmmakers shouldn't forget their audience because there are filmmakers who 
don't give a shit about the audience, and basically wanking. And you didn't. And it was wonderful to see last night how we were managing to laugh our asses off for two hours um, in a full cinema. It perfectly worked. Wonderful. And you already mentioned Ella, this wonderful, versatile um, actress from Switzerland. I was very surprised to hear yesterday that she was she came on board after you already started filming because there was an, a German actress who w was so ill that she had to be replaced. Who was that poor girl and how was it for you to be confronted on set with someone you, you didn't expect, like Ella? Um, yeah, I think the again, the, the fear is and uh, of failing is a great driving force, you know, and we were like really faced with very we were not in control at all when we were beginning to shoot this film, so it was very much to the theme of the of the story. And uh, yeah, there was a German actress called Paula Beer that was gonna play the uh, that role in the film. Uh, she she's absolutely lovely. We had met once and and read with Sverir, who plays uh, Alphonse, and then very unfortunately she got very ill, and uh, we were always hoping that she would be able to come and then we just had to start shooting and then it became evident that she just would not be you know fit to come and film intensely for five weeks uh, so on the first day of shooting we had to start looking for another actress and at the same time Tim was uh, in in, uh, in a quarantine in London yeah. and it's an ensemble piece with five actors who are in together in most of the scenes so we only had three of them uh, up in that hotel and we were trying to figure out stuff what we could do and 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 I remembered um, uh, after the first day of shooting I had uh, I had a Zoom with, with Ella who was uh, actually had also COVID in Paris uh, <laughs> and she was in quarantine um, and um, I immediately liked her very much and I thought she was just really had the right energy for the role and then there was a whole fiasco of bringing her to Iceland because she couldn't travel because she was still testing positive uh, although she didn't have COVID anymore and um, when she went to the airport and she was supposed to fly they forced her to do a test and they didn't let her on board the plane and then Grimar our producer managed to find another take it you know uh, uh, on another plane a bit later and then she came to board the uh, check in for that and then was the same people that were checking in so she went <laughs> into the uh, toilet and changed her clothes and her hair <laughs> and came back and and, and used her uh, acting skills to mm. and and they were like yeah it's weird because there was an actress here earlier she had the same problem <laughs> um, but yeah then she came and and what helped, so we, we didn't get very much prep all mm. together, uh, but what really helped is that we we started in the hotel where we all lived together and worked together, and that sort of really created a good atmosphere. Uh, and uh, and of course, we were all strangers, you know, none of us had to work together, but uh, luckily it was all really, really great people, and, and, and we all had, I think, a, a lot of fun making this this film. Uh, but what you said before about the audience also is like it's very interesting also just for me as a filmmaker because when you're making a film you're always working in the dark you're always guessing how people are going to react to things and yes you, of course you do certain testing in the editing process but you never really know what you have until you see the film like last night with a group you know f full of people and, and, and how they react and that, that's the big sort of test to a film you know if it works or not and it's, it's very concrete you can really feel how it plays so that's nice one quick question since we speak about the german element of the film because it is a german co-production you've got a great german company involved mm -hmm. um what did they bring to the table um we did um, um, a lot of the post-production in Berlin. We did the sound mix and we did the color grading. And then, you know, great collaborators who were doing a second film together. So they were really involved th through the script stage, the casting and, um, and financing, of course. And so, um, it's, you know, filmmaking is a big uh, team sport and, and yeah. the, the, they're an important component to that. Yeah. 
We have time for one last question, because there's a flight to catch, I think. Thank you. My question goes to Mr. Sigurd John. Uh, I think it's I not on. Confess. Or maybe you can, can you hear me now? Yes. That's yes. To Mr. Sigurd John, can, um, I must confess I have never seen a film of you. It's very pity because after all, hearing this, I must go there. Um, what in your uh, mind is uh, your dif the difference between your kind of deeply human comedy and perhaps Mr. Aki Kawasmeki, because him I like very much. <laughs> They're very deeply human, uh, I think, as well. Uh, wonderful comedies, dark comedies. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a very big fan of his work. So uh, what was the question? Was it the difference between his? Me and him. Uh, I, yeah, no, no, we are, we are very <laughs> different <laughs> different filmmakers, I think. You know, he's a, yeah, uh, but he's, he's a filmmaker that I, I admire very, very much, yeah. Kaurismaki, Aki Kaurismaki, the Finnish director. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Yeah. I think we have to leave. Thank you all very much, and thank, thank you. you two for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.